The Gospel of St. John is one of those Gospels, well, is the Gospel that is possibly most, the most profound in its theology, in its understanding and study of God. Often also almost mystical, as they say, speaking in a language which isn't direct, it's not, it's not there's this fact and there's this fact, but speaks in a way which can only be understood fully with God's grace. But there is a recurring theme in the Gospel of John, and he begins with that theme, and that theme is the light, that Christ is the light. Now, there's a lot of talk about light and darkness just recently in our own culture, at the risk of uh, mentioning pop, pop culture. We see it, uh, I remember when I, when I was young, I was 83 or 85, The Return of the Jedi came out. I don't know for those who remember that far back. <clears throat> I was very little at the stage. And there's a lot of talk about the force and the light and the darkness. And it's almost as if they were equal. And this whole discussion through the whole series, which is stronger, the light or the darkness? But we know by our very experience, the darkness can never overcome the light. In the morning when you wake up, you just pull the curtain back and everything is lit up by the sun. The darkness cannot linger where the light is. It is impossible. How much more than when that light is infinite and eternal, when it is God himself. And so Christ came into the world. He was always here in the sense that he created the world and he created us. But he took on flesh so that he could be with us in this very, and it's already, he was already here in a real way, but in this more intimate way, if you will, so that we can see him, our God, sharing our lot, our difficulties, our nature, and our sufferings. He came so that there might be light in the world, that we may not have to stay in the darkness. We have a building over here, the Aloysius building, the big one over here, and where we go in, there is no light switch. And in the dark, it's, when we go in at night, it's very, very dark. <clears throat> and only because I know the layout fairly well, I can walk around it without tripping over anything. But sometimes we have a youth group in there and they'll move things around, they'll put things out like table tennis tables, big things. You walk straight into it, it's painful. The light removes that pain if you just turn the light on, and so it is with the light of God. The light of God is not there to make us suffer. It's there to relieve us of suffering that we would experience if we choose to remain in the darkness. If I went over to that building and said, no, I'm just gonna walk around in the dark, go up and down stairs, eventually I'm gonna trip over <clears throat> and do some damage, serious or otherwise. If I would be so ridiculous, so stubborn for some reason not to turn on the light. The unfortunate thing though is that the light of Christ is not forced upon us. Just as opening the curtains in the morning is not forced upon us, you can leave them shut all day. You can, put, you can black out your windows if you will. The light is still there, but we have chosen to block it out. And that is the only way that darkness can ever overcome light. It doesn't actually overcome light. It's just that we do not let the light in. We choose to live in the darkness. And that is ridiculous. Ask any, any person uh, that has lost their sight. They may get used to it. Uh, they may be accustomed to it. But I don't know if there'd be many who said, oh, I, I prefer the darkness to the light. <coughs> because in the darkness, uh, in the darkness there are many things hidden. And often, often maybe that's why we go to the darkness. As maybe that's why we prefer to keep out of the light because there are things in our life Continue, uh, which we are doing now, that we've done in the past, that we do not want anyone to see, including God. Now, we can hide things from men, and sometimes it's prudent to not show uh, things to men. But we can hide nothing from God. Nothing. There is nothing that we do. Our most secret thoughts, our most secret desires, He knows them. He knows them better than we know them. The thing is, we have nothing to fear by allowing God's light into our life. We need to remember that Christ says, I have come to give mercy. He hasn't come to judge us now. He will judge us later at our death, but now is the time of mercy. 
that light therefore is, has a bleaching effect as well, if you will. Just as you leave something out, and, uh, a t-shirt out, <coughs> excuse me, too long in the sun, it will start to bleach. Or if you have a head like mine, it will start to bleach as well. The fact is, is that Christ, through his light, wants to clean our souls, wants to relieve us of the burden that we put on ourselves through our sin and through our hiding from him, keeping our eyes closed, blacking out the windows of our souls so that we won't let the light shine in. He comes to bring us peace. He comes to bring us truth. But there can be no peace or truth without light. Even the pagan philosophers of Greece understood that we have to know ourselves, but in order to know ourselves, we need the light of reason. That's uh, also given to us by God. But God gives us this extra light of this supernatural truth of why, who we are, of what we were created for. He answers all those, quest those questions. Why am I here? Why is there suffering? What happens after life? They're all answered in the light of Christ. And this light came to us, not as some burning sun that we can barely look at or that we can't look at at all. His light came as something very subtle, very gentle, and certainly nothing to be afraid of. He came as a baby. He came not to <clears throat> intimidate us by his power and his glory. He did, wasn't born in any kind of palace or anything like that. He was born in a stable. Almost no one took any notice. The only people who took notice were poor shepherds and they took a, an army of angels to come and tell them about it. And three wise men who through the study of, of uh, wisdom, what they called the wisdom literature of the time, had come to know that this king was to be born. They saw past his poverty, they saw past his littleness, and they recognized him as king. Christ doesn't want us to be afraid. He wants us to go towards him. But he wants us also to accept the light in our life that we might change our lives. There is no real joy in our life without his light, without his truth. There is no joy because without the truth of God, there is no truth at all. There is only our own lies that we tell ourselves and that we tell one another and that we justify. Christ is is the only one who can justify us. And that is why he has come, that we may have true justification with his grace, one for us through his incarnation, through his uh, death and resurrection and ascension. He calls us now in this hour of mercy. He calls us with arms spread out wide, as a, child, as a child, as a baby, he wants us to embrace him. He wants to embrace us. Let us not fear God. Let us not fear the baby Jesus. Again, that's unreasonable. Who fears a baby? Who fears holding him in his arms, in their arms? <clears throat> if we are unsure what to do, how to do it, we go, of course, to his mother. When the Magi came, when the wise men, they found him sitting on the throne. They found Christ sitting on the, on the throne of the knees of his mother. She is the one who presents him to us. And she is the one who will also help us to make ourselves presentable to him. She will also teach us how to prepare ourselves. We know that Christ was born in a stable. <coughs> Excuse me. And a stable is not a very nice place, not really. It's full of animals, it's full of manure, it's full of flies probably as well. And yet Our Lady, and I'm sure St. Joseph as well, prepared that stable to make it fit, or at least suitable for Christ to be born. Our own hearts at times feel like they are also a stable, full of manure, full of wild animals, <clears throat> full of flies full of stenches and it doesn't matter let me finish it doesn't matter that it's a stable it matters that it smells it matters that there are wild animals and that it's full of manure but that can be cleaned out through that great sacrament of mercy 
of reconciliation. Let us take advantage of that. It, is, it can be scary, it can be intimidating to go to what seems just a man, but the man stands in the person of Christ, the priest, to, to, profe- to profess our sins. No, we don't profess, to confess our sins. But in doing that, we go towards that light, uh, exposing ourselves, our inner thoughts, our inner sins, our burdens, what's on our conscience to God, and He will forgive every single one of them if we are sorry. He will infallibly remove them and we start anew with a soul filled with light. Let us pray, therefore, that we may have the courage and the knowledge how to prepare our souls so that we may truly have Christ born in the stable of our hearts this Christmas. It is what God wants above all things for us. He wants it more than we do. If he wants it, therefore, it's possible We mustn't write ourselves off or say, no, I can't change, and even I don't want to change. We pray even for that desire to be the saint that God created us to be. A saint is simply somebody who wills and strives and seeks the will of God in their lives. We pray to the Virgin Mary, therefore, and to Saint Joseph, that this may be true in our lives. It is possible. Let us pray for the desire and make it happen so that we might truly, by the end of this Christmas octave and by the time Christmas comes around next year, be a better person, be a truly good person for our own joy, our own peace, for the love of God and for the good of all men around us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.